What up, though? You already know how it go. Smash, like, subscribe, comment. I don't care what you comment as long as you comment, you dig. I want to tell y'all the story about the biggest goon from Linwood since the YBI days, a brother by the name of TTO Tim. Every time I look up his uh, MDLC picture, he, he got a black eye, he got a cut on him or something like that. Brother really bought that action. I was locked up with him um, a while ago in the county jail. He stayed in some stuff. People really gravitate, gravitated towards him. He's a real enig enigmatic figure. Mother supported him a lot. You know, he had money coming in, so on and so forth. So, he, you know, guys just gravitated towards him because his reputation on the street. TTO stands for the takeover. It was a, a, a gang, basically, that was growing. I mean, it's pretty much dead now. I mean, ain't nobody out there representing it, but they was putting on a name for themselves out there, man. And, you know, it ain't the right way. But what else? How else do you expect the gang to operate out here these days? They got no guidance, no real source of income, robbers, thieves. Ain't really doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? But looking at the paperwork, it's kind of shocking. He told on himself about one of the homicides that he got 54 years on. Well, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, about two of them. I'm going to read from uh, the transcripts about two of them and the, the appeals. About two of the murder cases that he got. It's crazy. Right? Now, the first case stems from a fatal shooting on October 25th, 2012. On a date, the victim, Demetrius Cole, attended a relative's wedding reception in Detroit. After the reception, Cole was in the parking lot outside of the event hall while family members loaded items into a large van. A shooting then occurred during which Cole sustained a fatal gunshot wound to the chest. None of Cole's family members testifying in trial actually saw the shooting or saw a defendant at the scene. Nobody's seen this, right? Case closed, beat. But nah, nah, nah. We, we're going to keep going. However, Cole was in possession of a gun that evening, and there was evidence that he fired on his assailants. Shortly after the shooting, defendants sought medical treatment for a gunshot wound to his hand. The defendant being Tim. When questioned by the police on November 10th, 2012, the defendant initially claimed that he had been shot when a man tried to steal a cell phone. However, in a second interview on November 11th, 2012, the defendant confessed to his involvement in Cole's case. Right? Death informing of a plan, excuse me, death informing of a plan to steal Cole's watch. The defendant told police that his plan involved two other men. According to the defendant, Cole fired during the attempted robbery at which uh at the which time one of his uh other men that he was with shot Cole. He didn't specifically name no names, but he said that he did that. Um defendants video police interviews were admitted into evidence at his trial and viewed by his jury. The jury convicted defendant as noted above. Defendant now appeals his right. I'm not gonna get back on that. This case, um, in this case, police first interrogated the defendant in an interview room at a police facility on November 10th, 2012, which was 16 days after he was shot in the hand and well after he received medical uh, treatment for his injury. The record discloses and defendant does not dispute that the officers properly advised him of his Miranda. The Mirandas, if you don't know, you got the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of the law. You are a whooping attorney, so on and so forth. That's your Miranda right. So they basically tell you, you don't got to talk to us. You can invoke your fifth and shut up. But he didn't. He was advised of his um, uh, Miranda rights on November 10th. Um, in particular, after confirming that he could read and write, defendant read his rights allowed to police from um, an advice of his rights, he acknowledged that he understood those rights. He initiated next to each, uh, next each right on the form, which means he signed next to each statement and said that he understood it. Having been fully informed of his constitutional rights, the defendant made no effort to invoke his rights and instead freely answered the officer's questions. During the first interview, the defendant, um, Tim, made a few comments about pain in his hand and asked about his medication, but he also assured officers uh, more than once that he was able to continue speaking with them. Moreover, defendant did not implicate himself in Cole's death during the first interview, but instead told police that he was shot when someone tried to steal a cell phone. Eventually, after uh, a little more than an hour, 
after the defendant indicated that his hand hurt so bad, the police discontinued the interview so that the defendant could receive pain medication. At the close of the interview, the officers told the defendant that he would finish speaking with him tomorrow morning to get more information um, from him. It's almost like he wanted to get caught. Uh, one of the officers indicated that it was up to the defendant whether to speak with um, with him and defendant again acknowledged that he understood his constitutional rights. The following day, approximately 14 hours after the conclusion of the first interview, the same two officers spoke again with the defendant at the police station. They did not reiterate defendant's constitutional rights at the beginning of the second interview. By this time, the defendant had received medication, and he told the police that his hand was feeling better. In response to the police caution, the defendant eventually implicated himself in Cole's death and acknowledged his roles in the plan to steal Cole's watch. So he turned around and told on himself, they was trying to steal his watch. He fired a shot. Somebody else killed him. Now, I ain't saying he told on nobody else. Once again, let's make that clear. He, he told on himself. Right? Now, I don't think that makes you a snitch. It just makes you kind of dumb. But anyway, let's go on to the second uh, murder that happened at a gas station of uh, Charles Whitfield. Now, Charles Whitfield died after being shot twice in the back outside a gas station. According to Crystal Williams, Whitfield stopped at the gas station while giving her and Carmen Omer a ride from work. Omer testified that she and Whitfield went into the gas station, and Williams testified that she saw two people enter the gas station after Whitfield and Omer. According to Omer, two men came into the gas station and stood behind Whitfield at the cashier's booth. Um, when Omer left, the two men were still behind Whitfield. Omer went back to Whitfield's truck, but eventually she returned to the gas station Whitfield, because Whitfield had not yet come out. Whitfield was reading a newspaper by the front door, and Omer told him that Williams wanted him to come on. At that point, Omer ran back to the car and told Williams that she uh, that they should leave because she noticed that two men had not purchased anything. It was late. They were wearing all black and common sense was telling her that something was about to happen. Williams testified that she saw Whitfield and some other people come outside the gas station, according to Omer. The two men left the gas station. As soon as Whitfield left, they were close behind Whitfield when he approached the truck. Omer heard someone say and uh, she saw two guns and she ran. Omer ran in the direction of Williams, and Williams ran in another. Omer heard Williams say, no, 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 and then she heard two or three gunshots. When Omer looked back, Whitfield was on the ground behind his truck. Omer could not testify to the, um, I, Omer could not identify the men involved in the shooting because she did not look at them closely. Williams testified that she could not identify the men because she was distracted once again. Nobody can identify you. But anyway, Sergeant Ron Gibson, an expert in forensic videotape analyst, testified that he obtained video evidence from the gas station cameras, according to Gibson. The quality of the videotapes was poor, but he could see that one of the perpetrators had arm tattoos. As part of Gibson's analyst, he created photographs from the videotapes and then photographed Tim's, that's Tim, arm tattoos for comparison. He compared photographs looking for patterns, density, and basically consistency of tattooing or marking on the skin. Wait, wait. In same positions, on the same arms, right? But wait. Gibson found matching placement of tattoos between Tenno and one of the perpetrators. So we don't know which one. It's crazy. Specifically, the right arm tattoos have similar densities and proportions, including script lettering and the style of an eye, the shape, claps of hands, and a line lettering design. Gibson testifies sufficient number of similarities to prevent him from consideration, right? Tennell's mother testified that she could not recall making statements to the police. However, she acknowledged that a signature on the back of some photographs looked like her hers, her sons, and testified that she had told the prosecutor under oath doing an investigative subpoena that she was 100% certain the person in one of the photographs looked like her child. Turquoise Irvin testified that she did not know uh, Rutledge personally, but had seen him around and knew him as Murph. According to Irvin, the police show her photographs. Irvin identified one of the individuals as uh, Tim, and the other is Murph. In the video of Irvin's interview with the police, she identified Tim and Murph in the photographs response to the officer's question. Who was this? Irvin testified that she was being held 
in police custody and felt threatened by the police. Specifically, she was uh, concerned that the police would charge her as an accessory to the crime and she did not cooperate. During deliberations, the jury reviewed the videotape evidence. Ultimately, the jury found uh, Tenno and Rutherford guilty of first degree murder, felony murder, and possession of a firearm during the commissions of a felony. And them boys both got natural life without parole. Both cases, no evidence. One he told on himself. The second, he got 54 years for that, the second degree murder. And the reason why he got a second degree murder, not a felony homicide, he went for a robbery, but the dude put out the gun, so therefore that invokes his right to kill him. But you're still going to get sentenced. Then you got the premeditated homicide. Now, who knows why they killed him, but that's crazy. Your mother bammed you. I wonder how she feels as a mother, man. It's crazy stories, man. Peace and blessings be upon y'all. Big five. Smash like, comment, subscribe. Make sure y'all comment. Make sure y'all like the video, man. More of them coming, and I'm about to get on camera myself, man. Peace.